This is the Pearson LXL Core Pure Maths 2 paper. It's one of the sample papers, so the sample paper 2. In further maths, it's based on these two books. And uh, yeah, let's get straight into it. The first question, nice and straightforward, just one of those roots questions. So you've got three roots, alpha, beta, gamma. They must multiply to make this number over this number, except there's three of them. So when they multiply, they make a negative thing. So it's negative this over that. Of course, the one doesn't matter, and two negatives make positive, so we end up with this. And then we have um, that the sum of the double product of roots, so alpha, beta, plus alpha, gamma, plus beta, gamma, so all the products added together that are doubles, are going to be this one over this one, and because they're, they're in doubles and pairs, uh, that's going to be a positive, so we don't need to worry about the negatives in there. Um, so it's just 28 over 1, which is just 28. And then, of course, the sum of the roots themselves, just the individual roots, is going to be negative this over this. Again, this doesn't matter, this one. Negative negative 8 is just positive 8, so we get sum of roots as 8. And now we can work with this. Now, of course, to add these things together, u times this one by beta gamma over beta gamma, this one by alpha gamma over alpha gamma, this one by alpha beta over alpha beta, and you end up with this when you put them all together. Of course, this you have an expression for, or a numerical value for, and you also have one for this as well. So it's 28 over 32, which is 7 over 8. This next one then, so we just expand out uh, these three terms. You could do it more intelligent ways, but just expand these first two terms out, then expand into the last bit. And now here we've got the doubles, so we can factorize out a 2 with the sum of those. And here we've got the singles, so factorize out a 4 with those. Shove this 8 into there, this 28 into there, and we get the final answer that we need. Uh, and the very last bit, just take alpha plus beta plus gamma and square the whole thing. Of course, square the 8 as well, and we get this. You should have seen this kind of thing before, I'm sure. Expand this out, uh, so alpha times alpha is alpha squared, beta times beta is beta squared, gamma times gamma, gamma squared, and then alpha times beta plus a beta times alpha gives you two lots of those. It's two lots of all of them, actually, when you do that like that. And of course, factorize out the 2 from here, shove this 28 into there, and I believe we get the answer that we're looking for again. Number two then, a vectors question. I hope you weren't going to get one of these because there was one in sample paper one. But in any case, um, this is uh, the uh, a vector equation for a plane, uh, or normal, dot normal, I can't remember what it's called, equation for it. Uh, there's a formula to work out the distance between a point and a plane, uh, and it's, uh, so I, I wrote the plane as this, just rewriting this as x, y, z, and using a column form, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but this is the formula you want to use. Uh, so you essentially dot product together. The way that I remember it is not like this. I just dot product together the direction vector here with this point here, take away the 5, put that on the top, and then just divide by the length of this vector here. Important to not miss, uh, miss, uh, mix up the point and the, the vector here. Uh, it's the, it's the, so it's this one here. I, I also wrote that in this form, but it doesn't really matter. Oh, just to make it match with this, I think. Um, but yeah, so it's it's the dot product of, of this and this, minus this, and then all over the length of this bit, 3 minus 4 and 2. Of course, the negatives don't matter when you're squaring them. And then in any case, we'll end up with this here, which I chose, I chose to leave as this, just because it's quite nice. Uh, next is the plane has vector equation this. They're giving us a different form of a, a way of writing down what a plane is, which is fine. Uh, show that the vector is perpendicular. So all we have to do here is show that it's perpendicular to this one and this one separately. So dot product with uh, this with this, so this is minus 1, minus 3, 1, dotted with 2, 1, 5, that makes 0, I believe, and then dot it with this as well, 1, minus 1, minus 2, that also makes 0, and so because it's perpendicular, therefore, you can just state the result that if you dot two vectors together and get 0, they're perpendicular. Because it's perpendicular to both of these, then it's perpendicular to the plane, and, and that's just what you have to say. Show that the angle uh, between these, this plane and this plane is that. Again, you just use a formula here, which is uh, this formula for, for planes, and n is the normal vectors. So that was why they um, pointed out this normal vector to us uh, here for us to use, because now we can use that as the normal vector for this plane, and of course we can use this as the normal vector to this plane, because that's just what it is. Um, so we can dot this together with this, so 3 minus 1 minus 4, 3 uh, minus 1 and minus 3 and so on. So we dot those together to get 11, and then we find the length of each of these two vectors as well. Um, again, the negatives aren't going to matter, so just 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 1 squared, and, and likewise here, and take those underneath, and then do cos inverse of those things, and we'll end up with our answer, which is 52 to the nearest degree. Um, so, I mean, I don't really like vectors just because there's a bunch of random stuff to remember. Um, you, you can derive these results and do it, like, much longer, but again, that's kind of a waste of time, so you're best off just remembering these formula, which is great, but I, I'm just not very good at remembering things. Um, okay, so next, uh, for which values of a does this have an inverse? Does this not have an inverse? I'm oh, sorry, which does does this have an inverse? Um, I think I may have got this question wrong in this case, um, because okay, so anyway, you you find the determinant. Essentially, you want the determinant. Uh, 
it has an inverse when the determinant is not zero. Okay, no, I think I'm fine. I think I'm fine. So it's two times the determinant of this two by two, which is one minus minus two. So that's one plus two. So two lots of one plus two. And then minus a times the determinant of these four, which is minus one minus one, because minus one times, so that's there. And then plus four lots of this determinant, which is two minus one, which is just, uh, uh, we don't want that to be zero. Collect together these two. And I think we get, as long as a isn't minus five, we do have an inverse. I think I'm, I think I've got my, my wording correct there. Now, okay, so given that it's non-signal, so given that a isn't minus five and we do have an inverse, find the inverse matrix. So we have to do this by hand, which is super annoying, but uh, anyway, so we transpose this matrix. So instead of making that the first row, we make it the first column and this second row becomes this column and this third row becomes this column. Um, I've already actually written down, uh, when I simplify this, I get 2a plus 10. That's the determinant. Um, so I need the one over the determinant at the front once I'm done with this matrix. So I'll just put that down there for now. So we transpose the matrix. Um, once we've done that, uh, which I've done here, once we've done that, uh, we, we replace all of these entries with the determinant of the two by two matrices that don't involve them. It's called the minor matrix. I call it minors because that's my head of maths. But anyway, this two you replace with the determinant of these four. So you cross out this line because the two has that in it. Cross out this line and you find the determinant of this matrix here, which is one minus minus two, which is three and replace that with a three. And then to do this one, you cross out this line and this line and you find the matrix of uh, the determinant of a four, two and minus one, which is minus a minus eight and you replace it there and you just keep going replacing all of them and then you multi sort of multiply by this matrix it's not really a matrix is it you just kind of I, I, I've never really understood what the wording you're supposed to use here is but essentially this input up here you just don't change nor do you change this input this input here you times by minus one and likewise this input and this input and this input you times by minus one so okay I'm going to times all those inputs by minus one and not change the others um, and that's what's called the adjudicant matrix. And then the inverse matrix is just this times by this. And we have our inverse matrix. That's four marks. Is, that's annoying for four marks. I guess it's as long as you know how to do it, you can just do it. But anyway, then we have a completely random question on the end here that's just completely different. I, I thought we would at least use this for something, but apparently not. Uh, prove by induction this thing here. Okay, so we test it for n is 1. If n is 1, we just get this about 1, which is itself, which technically is the form this if you just write it nice and intelligently like that. Good, so it works for n is 1. So now we're going to just assume that it works for n equals k, where k is some positive integer. Uh, this is an incredible spelling of the word integer, but okay. Um, and then we, okay, we investigate. So we assume this is true, just to make it clear. And then we just consider n equals k plus 1. So we, we're putting k plus 1 into here. And of course, this is equal to the thing to the power k times the thing to the power 1. But of course, by the assumption step, uh, this is equal to this, uh, because we've assumed that's true. Uh, and now I can just multiply out these two matrices. So this one times this one, plus this times this will be my my new top left input. This times this, of course, is 0. Then this times this is 0, plus this times this is 0 as well. So that's going to be 0 there. Then this times this uh, gives me the 3, plus this times this is 6, gives me this input. And then this times this is 0 and this times this is one, and we just get one down here. So this looks pretty good uh, on the whole. I'm gonna put this three over here, and I'm just gonna replace this with three to the power one. I'm also gonna write six as three times two. Over here, we're good. Over here, we've got the right thing. Uh, here is three to the power k plus one, right? So that's also good, because I want this to be a k plus one here, and I want this to be a k plus one here, because that's what I'm using here. This is a little bit more tricky to deal with, but factorize out a three, and we end up with this. So I factorized out a three from this term and from this term. And now this, I can do the same thing I just did here, where this becomes 3k plus 1, and then minus 3, of course. So we get this, bring the 2 in, take away, this becomes a takeaway 1, and I think I end up with exactly the right thing. Um, and so if it's true for n equals k, then it's definitely true for n equals k plus 1. But since it's true for n equals 1, then it's true for all values of, or integer values of n. Um, and we're done. Good. Uh, question number four, I believe. That was the whole question. Good. Question number four. Show this thing. Okay, well, z is cos theta plus i sine theta. If it's modulus is one. Good. Um, that means z to the power n by de Morvis theorem is this. You don't need to prove that. You can just state it. Uh, z to the power minus n is this. Again, just replacing these with minus n's instead. Um, and 
what what's that useful for is because cos of minus something is the same of cos of just that same thing it's an even function sine of minus something is minus sine so this minus can come out to here which gives you this and of course z to the power minus n can also be written like that just by normal power rules which means we can now add these two things together uh, and we're going to get these two things cancelling and we get z to the power n plus one over z to the power n is just two lots of cos n theta and we'll have what they wanted me to get which is good uh, hence show this thing now hence means it's tempting to just use De Moivre's theorem in a different way, but hence means I have to use this result. So we have to start here. And it's tempting as well to put in a 4, because that immediately gets you maybe a, a, a 4 here, but that's not what you want to do. You just want to use n is 1 to start with, uh, and just replace all these with 1s, and you get this. And now you want to raise that to the power 4, because that's what's going to give you a z to the 4s, um, and your cos to the 4 here as well. Which is, which is what we wanted here. Now, of course, when you raise this to the power 4, you can do some binomial expansion. It's z to the power 4 plus 4, lots of z to the power 3 times this, which is z to the power 2, plus 6, lots of 2 of these and 2 of those cancel out, plus 4, lots of 1 of these and 3 of those balance out to a minus 2, and then just, just, um, just 4 of these, which is going to be z to the power minus 4. And now we can collect these together in a very suitable way. We can put this one next to this one and this one next to this one, factorize out the 4. And this, again, by this theorem, is just 2 cos 4 theta. Uh, and this here is 2 cos 2 theta. Um, I can times that by 4 to make 8 of them. And, uh, and I can also just swap this around to make it just look like this, I guess. Uh, divide by 2, I think I did first, and then I divided by 8, just to make it super clear how I got to this result. And I think we're good. I think this is correct. And we are done. Excellent. Question number five. A lot of differentiation to do here. I completely forgot McLaurin series is, is on this. I have somehow avoided teaching this part of the textbook uh, for uh, like I've never done it. So I, I completely forgot they were even in here. Um, but anyway, you, you, you differentiate four times. So differentiate this once. It's just a lot of product rule, isn't it? That becomes cos theta. Shine and cos both differentiate to the other one with positives. Like there's no it's not like the normal trig sine and cos. Uh, you know, it's, so sine. So this one, by product rule, you differentiate that, keep that one alone, leave that one alone, and then differentiate this. It just goes to cosh. And then you differentiate again. So there's two products to do here. Differentiate that for minus sine, leave that one alone. Uh, different, leave this one alone, differentiate that for cosh. D differentiate that for cosh, leave that alone. Um, cos, sorry, leave that alone. Leave that alone, and that differentiates to shine. So they, there's no negatives with the hyperbolic functions. Um, now, hopefully, what you notice here is that these two cancel out and these two come together. If you didn't notice that, this question becomes much worse. Um, but now we just do another set of product, right? Le differentiate that for minus sine, leave that alone. Um, differentiate that for shine, leave that alone. This doesn't cancel, so we just have to do four products again. Um, I'll be a bit quicker this time. We get all this. And again, this cancels. Um, this one goes away with this one, and we just get minus two lots of this, which I believe, sorry, minus four lots of this which I believe is minus 4y as intended. So that's nice. We got it. Uh, hence find uh, the first non-zero terms of McLaurin. Now, McLaurin series is actually just a special Taylor series, although that's not very helpful to know because Taylor series isn't in regular core pure pe uh, textbooks, so that's weird. But McLaurin series is actually just a Taylor series evaluated at zero. Um, again, not helpful since you don't know what a Taylor series is probably, but whatever. Taylor series are great. I'm not just saying that because Taylor Swift is incredible. They're generally just... Uh, they're just, they're just great. They're amazing. You should look them up. Anyway, this is um, what the textbook says the McLaurin series is, so we'll just use it. f of 0, we notice, is just 0, because sine of 0 is 0, so this just all goes away. Now, f dashed of 0, f dashed is, is, is just dy by dx, isn't it? So f dashed is also 0, though, because both shine and sine are both 0 at 0. So whenever we have any of those anywhere, they're just going to make everything 0. So that's also 0. Um, now here is our first term that isn't, because cos and cosh are both 1 at 0. So this is 2 times 1 times 1, which is 2. Um, so we have a first non-zero term of the Maclaurin series here, because that's not, 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 not that's non-zero. Sorry, that is 0, so it's not non-zero. This is 0. This is our first non-zero term. Then we get a bunch more zero terms, right? Because these both have sine and shines in them, so they go away. There's nothing there. These both do. I mean, this is minus 4y, isn't it, as we said, but y is 0. Um... So that is also zero, the fourth one. The fifth one is going to be zero because you can kind of just think of it as going back to this one again. And when you differentiate this, you've already said that that's zero 
when you evaluated that as zero. So the next one is also going to be zero. And it, it's kind of tricky to think through this. The next one is minus eight because you're kind of, like I said, re repeating this motion again. But this time you're doing it minus with a minus four in front. And of course, zero times minus four is still zero, but two times minus four is minus eight. If you wanted to be sure about this, you could just differentiate some more and find out. But I'm, I'm playing fast, fairly fast and loose here and just kind of getting it done um, logically. The next term is going to be zero, and so is the one after that. It's actually going to be the next time we don't have a zero, we've kind of reset here again at f8. Um, this is going to be minus 4 times minus 4 times y, but that's still 0. So the next one's going to be 0, and then this one is, again, times it by 2 lots of minus 4, or just times this one by minus 4, and we'll get to 32. And that will be our third non-zero term. Um, and so I think we can just use this term, this term, and this term now. Um, so the, the second derivative is divided by 2 factorial x squared. Um, the sixth derivative divided by 6 factorial x6. And then this derivative divided by 10 factorial x to the 10. You can type these in to simplify them and you'll get this here. And that will be the first three non-zero terms, I believe. Okay, um, so that's that. Again, not too much justification is necessary there, aside from just following that pattern. So I think we're good to go. Find the expression for the nth non-zero term. So, okay, the non-zero terms go 2, 4, sorry, 2, 6, 10, 14, and so on. So the nth term of that is 2n minus 4, sorry, 4n minus 2, I believe. So that's cool. So, okay, that's going to be our power of x then. It's going to be x to the 4n minus 2. But also it's going to be our factorial on the bottom, right? Because that's just what we have to factorial is the same number here and here. Now, what about the top number? Well, that starts at 2, and then we have to times by minus 4 every time to get to the next one. But we don't times by minus 4 immediately, so I think to counteract that I'm going to use an n minus 1 term up here. Because that means on the first term, when n is 1, I'm not going to do anything with this because 1 times 1 is 0 and this just becomes 1. It's the second term is where I want to introduce the first minus 4. Um, so, so I can use that to offset, and then of course we have the x to the power, as I mentioned before. And I think this is, is a way to make it work. There are other representations you could use, I think, but I think that will work. Again, no real explanation is needed, so you just need to try stuff until you've found something you're happy with, and, uh, and we'll have our answer. Kind of a weird question. I haven't really seen anything like this before in, in these exam papers. Okay, next one. So we look at this. Uh, the first thing that's wrong with it is that it's not in a bracket here. This should be z minus brackets something, so I'll do that properly. Now it's this. And this is a circle centered at 4, 3, radius 5. Um, so cool. So we can draw that if we want to. Uh, radius 5, just notice, uh, 4 across 3 up to the center. That's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So the circle should go exactly through the origin. Um, which is cool, although they didn't actually... Oh, no, they did ask us to draw it. Yeah, show on Narg under arm. So there it is. Um, so, so I've done that. And uh, cool. Now we've got this thing here. And it's saying that we can represent this instead of via our usual modulus form or even by Cartesian form, we could represent it in polar form instead. Now, I represented it with Cartesian form first. I don't know why I clicked that, but I did apparently. So this is it clearly in Cartesian form, radius squared over here, and then the center 4, 3. And now I can just replace, to get to polar form, you can just write x as r cos theta and y as r sine theta. Um, so we just shove those two things in here. And this is very straightforward from here, I think. You just square these out. So this is r cos theta times r cos theta minus 8 lots of r cos theta plus 16. And likewise for this one, of course, factorize an r squared out of these two terms and we get cos squared plus sine squared, which is just 1. Uh, just notice how 16 plus 9 is 25, so those cancel. Um, this becomes 1, we can move these two terms over to the other side, and of course we can divide by r because r isn't 0, and we can get our polar form here, which is good. Excellent. So our next step, ooh, this is, uh, so this is our drawing uh, that I just wrote down with Cartesian form there. Our next step is to um, set up points defined by the circle we were just using, which is why I've drawn it down already, uh, along with this sort of half line here, which starts at 0, which is this line across here, and goes to pi over 3. So it ends up being up here somewhere. So there's a half line going up here somewhere. Now, and then bounded again by 0. And we're looking for the set of points that's uh, between 0 and pi over 3, so in this bracket here, and within the circle, so less than 5. So within the circle, that will be this region in here. Um, that's the best way to shade stuff in PowerPoint, I think. 
Um, now, so that's good there. And now find the exact region. Now, I paused on this for a little bit because usually in these questions, the best way to do this is just to completely ignore the fact that you're in complex numbers and complex number land and just do some Cartesian coordinate stuff, like maybe split the areas up and then add them together. And that will work. It's just very difficult to do it exactly. What you need to do here that's just a much more efficient way of doing it is to, and this is why I've left this up here, is to not ignore all of the work that you did before you got to this part of the question. Just, and it, this is a really good hint, if you're ever stuck in a question, just take 10 seconds to read through the question from the top and just think to yourself, is there anything they've asked me to do so far in this question that might be helpful? And they've got you to work out this circle in polar form. And that's gonna be helpful because it means to find this area, you can just integrate between zero and pi over three, those two lines there. Um, and do half of r squared, because that's how we integrate in polar form. Half the integral between the two lines of r squared. And this integral will get us the answer. Um, so of course we expand this out, so this is this times this, and then cross terms and so on, we get all this. Um, now integrating this isn't too bad, right? Except integrating cos squared and sine squared is not that easy. So what we can do is, this is the only double identical identity I ever remember, along with sine squared, sine 2 theta equals 2 sine cos. Um, but of course I can replace sine squared with 1 minus cos squared to get this, and then rearrange for cos squared. And likewise, you can replace cos squared with 1 minus sine squared to get that, rearrange for sine squared, and then you can shove those two results in here, times this one by 64 gives you 32 lots of the top line. Um, so I think that's what I wrote down here. I replace this one with 36 gives you 18 of the top line, which is right here. And then also these two middle terms here, like I said, sine 2 theta is 2 cos sine, times that by 48 and you get 96 cos sine, which is this, so we can replace that with there. And all of these things, I think I can tidy it up even actually, yeah, because these two things. Um, all of this will very easily integrate. Um, how did I get to 14 of those? Oh, this minus this, of course, yeah. Um, this will very easily integrate now. I think I actually halved everything. I did. I ignored the question now because all I have to do is do this. These integrate very easily. Um, cos integrates so to sine, sine integrates to negative cos, divide both by two because of this. And then you can do this with a calculator, of course. But also, though, for practice, you could do it without because these are just cos of 2 pi over 3 inside of 2 pi over 3, which is doable without. When you put in 0, everything goes away, except for this bit, which is a minus 12. So it's minus minus 12, which is positive 12, which gives that an 18. That's 7 root 3 over 4, and I think we have our answer just there. Good. I think this is the last question, um, which feels like it's come out fast. Show this thing first. So let's uh, firstly make ourselves this, so differentiate this. F and R are functions, they're not consonants. So when I differentiate this, I get 0 0.2 df by dt plus 0 0.1 dr by dt. And then what I decided to do was just shove, or just say this is the left-hand side and just shove this into there, which gave me that. Um, I can now take these kind of expressions and shove those into here. I think I did this very slowly just because I didn't have a lot of space to work with. So first what I did was I just replaced dr by dt, it looks like, with um, this expression, and I also simplified 0 0.2 minus 0 0.6 is minus 0 0.4 of these, and now I simplified this because I can combine these two things together a little bit to make this and this, and now I can shove this expression into here, um, and then again expand out, and thankfully everything cancels, which is 0, and we get the right hand side, therefore showing what they wanted me to show. Find a general solution for the number of foxes, so it equals 0, which is good, there's no work to do there. Um, we've also just got, I mean, we can just get the auxiliary equation, m squared minus 0.6m plus 0 0.1 equals 0, or w is apparently, whatever you want to use, it doesn't really matter. Solve this in a calculator, you get this. This is two complex roots, so the solution for f is of the form e to the this number, t, brackets a cos of this number plus b sine of this number, t, and that's the solution generally. And uh, I think that's all I need to do, uh, because now it says hence, so again, hence means, we saw this earlier in the paper, use this result. So use this result to find the general solution for the number of rabbits, so find r. Well, we can use this equation, I think, because if I just differentiate f and put it in here, and then put this f into here, that just gives me r in a bunch of, in terms of t, right? So if I differentiate f by product rule, remember, so differentiate this to make this, leave this alone, and then leave this alone, differentiate this. Now, when I differentiate both of these, I get 0.1a this, 0.1b this. I can factorize out that 0 0.1 and put it there. Cos differentiates to minus sine, sine differentiates to cos. So we get this, um, which I think I can then just put into here. 
yeah this is a mess but I did it anyway put all of this into here plus 0 0.2 lots of all of this which is there plus 0 0.1 R times everything by 10 is the obvious step to do here and then notice that this and this completely match up so if I just take away this from both sides um, just taking away two lots of those just gives you one lot of them left over and we get this line um, and this is this is pretty good um, and I think in fact I think aside from just factorizing out the e to the 0.3t I think I'm pretty much done I could do some more collecting but uh, I don't really care at the moment so I think this is done and uh, and that'll be my my answer uh, next bit at the start of year 2000 there are six boxes okay so now we finally have some boundary conditions so when t is zero because that's the start of the survey um, f equals six and r equals 20 which I'm just going to make some more space here. Um, so that's cool. So I can substitute those into here. Now, when t equals 0, that equals 1. That goes away. So I end up actually with just 6 equals a, I believe, because that becomes a 1 as well when you put t as 0 in. So yeah, a is 6, which I can then shove into here. And now I can use r is 20. In fact, I think I did I? Yeah, sorry. I can use r is 20 and then t is 0. So that again becomes 1. That goes away, that goes away, that becomes a 1, so I've gone 6 plus b equals 20, so b is 14, and I can re uh, I can now write out my two things with the two values that I know. This one can actually now be simplified a little bit to that, and we're good to go. We're rolling well here, I think. So in the model, which year are the rabbits predicted to die out? Well, we just set r to be 0, right? And, and of course, this can't be 0, which means this is uh, take away 20 get this I guess uh, divide by cos 0.1t and divide by 8 gives you tan 0.1t equals this type inverse tan of this into calculator and get this now t can't be negative because we can't yeah so what we have to do is quickly get out the tan graph and say okay we were looking for some negative value down here and we found this negative t solution over here we don't like that though what we want to do is go over and find this solution which would be pi minus the solution we just found so let's do pi it's actually pi plus this solution we just found because it's really a negative and we get 1.95 so that's this value here and of course that equals 0.1t divide by 10 and we get 19.5 and 19.5 years is means it will die out during the year 2019 i believe is is, is what we can say there uh, how many foxes will be on the island when the rabbits die out now that's not hard to do at all you just put in the value we just found into f and you get I assume two free marks for doing that so that's very nice it will be error carried forward of course as, as well so even if you got this wrong just by substituting that value into here you'll get two marks so never give up on a question error carried forward really useful anyway you get this we get this many foxes and then it says user answers to part one and two as to comment on the model so what this model is saying is that in two, 2019 there will be zero rabbits and 3754 foxes on the island which if that sounds ridiculous to you you have some common sense um, because of course that's ridiculous like the when the prey numbers start to die out the predator numbers start to die out as well because there's less prey for them to eat so this like the model just sends one of them up as the other one goes down sort of but that's not going to happen at all right like that's not how this works so it will probably be how it works to start with but as time goes on um this just won't work at all and and this is just a ridiculous number so just say something like that you don't have to be as sarcastic as i am but you could be and that would be fine too anyway thank you for watching and i'll see you next time